All right, thank you so much for joining us for ONLA webinars. We have a wonderful webinar for you today. It is Five Important Ornamental Insects and Mites with Steve Larson. Steve, thanks so much for being with us. Take it away. Okay, thank you so much, Summer. Uh, and uh, I hope everybody had a good lunch and uh, ready to go here with an afternoon seminar. I'll do my best to keep you wide awake while you digest that lunch. And uh, let me again introduce myself. I'm Steve Larson. I'm the ornamentals specialist, sales specialist in the greenhouse and nursery markets for Bayer, Bayer Environmental Science. And I am coming to you uh, live and a bit warmer, I think, than uh, those of you in Oklahoma today. I live down near Houston in the thriving metropolis of Katy, Texas. And uh, our temperatures have yet to receive the, the cold front that's apparently gonna affect most of us across uh, the central part of the United States. But I was just checking my, my weather app and I see that it's pretty, pretty chilly up in Oklahoma way right now. So I hope you're bundled up. And, uh, and you know this, this presentation probably seems a little out of place during the, uh, the tundra months that we have here in January and February. But you know, springtime's not too far away. And what I've tried to do with this presentation today is select five insect pests. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually kind of uh, using a little license here with the word insect because I'm gonna include mites as well. We often think of insects and mites together as one. So four insects and uh, a group of mites that we're gonna talk about today. And a lot of these pests that I'm gonna uh, be presenting on tend to occur during the springtime months and early summer months. So hopefully in the next uh, few weeks or a couple of months, uh, we'll be encountering these pests. And when that happens, uh, I hope that you'll be able to reflect back on this uh, talk and dig into some of the info uh, and that it might provide you some, some help and support. Even though I am uh, a specialist on the commercial production of ornamental plants, I've spent uh, over 40 years in the horticulture industry. I worked uh, in greenhouse and nurseries early in my career and have worked a majority of my career uh, working either as a technical specialist or as a sales specialist uh, with different chemical companies. And so I've had a lot of interaction over the years, not only with growers, but with landscapers as well. So what's nice about this particular topic that we picked today is that I can kind of speak to ornamentals kind of in a general sense, both from a production standpoint and a landscape uh, standpoint. Uh, along the way, if there's some questions, uh, feel free to type those in to the Q&A. Uh, Summer, I've given her permission to interrupt me if there's a, a short uh, uh, question that I can answer. If you have something that might require a little bit more time, we'll have plenty of time at the end of the presentation uh, for me to entertain your question. So I'd be happy to do that. So let's, uh, Let's advance forward. By the way, uh, we'll come back to talk about this particular picture you see here. This is a picture I took in California of a rose grower in California uh, that produces uh, about 6 million roses a year on, oh, I don't know how many acres that is. It's over two, two to 300 acres, I believe. All these field grown bare root roses. So a lot of the roses that you see in the garden centers for sale by, uh, by nurseries were grown uh, usually as field-grown roses, and then they're dug bare root and potted up. But I'll come back to this because this particular grower really utilizes some of the uh, suggestions that I've made uh, over the years in helping to manage some of his mite problems. And I, I just want you to sort of remember that picture uh, as we uh, come back to it, but that'll be in a few minutes here. Now I've just advanced the slide and hopefully you'll be able to see a picture uh, on the left of a flower bud that uh, is, is nicely covered by a host of aphids. And then there's a couple of pictures on the right hand side of some individuals. So the first pest, the insect pest I wanna talk about is probably the easiest one we'll talk about in terms of control. And that's uh, the group called aphids. Now, before I get too far along here, I also wanna make comment that I'm a chemical guy. You know, I work for Bayer and so uh, we're in the, in the business of manufacturing pest solutions for, uh, for growers across uh, all different types of markets. And consequently, we use a number of synthetic chemistry type products, but we also use some biological products and offer biological products uh, in our portfolio. 
And I don't want to discount the importance of different biocontrols, especially for those of you that might be in the greenhouse business, because greenhouses uh, are an environment where we sort of have a, a controlled, enclosed environment where we can capture uh, various uh, uh, predators of some of our pests so that we can get biological control. I'll speak to that as we go along, but what I'll be talking to in dealing with a lot of the pests today are kind of these uh, runaway situations where you have an infestation of a particular insect pest that has gotten beyond the uh, capabilities of the biocontrols uh, that might be out there either naturally or those that we've imposed on them in a production environment. And once we have an infestation that's kind of a runaway uh, circumstance, uh, we oftentimes rely on chemical controls because they're both fast and effective and they work across a lot of different environmental situations. So let me just kind of make that disclaimer at the outset. But as we talk about aphids, uh, aphids are soft bodied insects. Uh, they're fairly easy to control with contact as well as preventive type, type uh, systemic controls. And so I'd, I'd uh, like to uh, make a comment to you that, uh, that this particular group of insect pests are very, very easy uh, to deal with, both as a, from a preventative standpoint and from a curative standpoint. A couple of things to think about with aphids, take a look there at your uh, lower right hand picture. And that is a, a female and most of the, uh, the, the feeding uh, aphids are females. Uh, they have mouth parts that are called sucking and piercing mouth parts. It's uh, referred to as a stylet. It's like a straw with a, with a sharpened end that they can you know, use to puncture into a stem or a petiole of a leaf, uh, or they can use to puncture into cells that are uh, right there on the leaf surface. And then they can draw out the nutrients that uh, exist right there. So it's important that you know that uh, sucking piercing insects avail themselves to various systemic insecticides so that if we can get the insecticide inside the plant and they slurp it up with the, uh, the goodies they're trying to suck out of the, uh, the vascular system of the plant, uh, they're very easy to control. One thing that's unique about aphids is that they don't lay eggs. Uh, even though that one picture in the upper right might look like an egg, that's actually honeydew that's being excreted by the aphid. But take a look down there in that lower right hand picture and you'll see that there's a female that's actually giving live birth to its young and that's something that's unique with aphids uh, they they actually give live birth as opposed to laying eggs and so once it's completes its life cycle um, it it gives live birth to a number of progeny not just one at a time well one at a time but not just one but multiple uh, younger aphids and they can rapidly, rapidly expand in their numbers over a short period of time, such that you might have what you see in that left-hand picture there, where you just virtually got almost all of the, uh, the stem leading up to the flower completely covered with feeding aphids. Now, Steve, another- Steve, yes. sorry to interrupt you. Yes. But we are still on the first slide. We can see the slides to the side of the screen, Okay. I've, I, I've got a, a slide here. I mean, I've, let me back up. You know, I had an email come through to me here. Okay. Let's just see here, let me back up. Okay, I went back to the first slide. Do you see that? Which is the, has purple. Yes, we see that it actually hasn't changed on my side. Okay, still okay, now, right now, now I've, just, I've just advanced the slide one. Okay, now it's still the same. Okay, back up. I'm using, um, I've, got, I've got my uh, VPN turned off. I've got pretty fast internet. So I'm, I'm hoping and assuming that it's not. Um, you know what might be helpful if some of the other, I see a QA and a question mm -hmm. there. Let's see, is that somebody, picture has an advance, so an anonymous. If that person that typed that could type again, hang on, I see two answers. Like a copy, like a copy. Okay, we've already got people that want copy. Well, it, I may have to give that the copy out, right? <laughs> <laughs> In order for people to know what I said, to see what I said. Um, if that person who typed the, the first message at 108, and uh, if you would come back, and say, has it adva advanced at this point? Just say yes or no would be great. 
I'm going to keep this open. By the way, we've got plenty of time here. So if we're delayed for a couple of minutes here, we should be okay to get through the, the, the presentation. And I don't see them responding here. <clears throat> still has an advance for you? No, Summer? still, the, still okay. the same screen. I'm, I'm going to advance again. Oh, there we go. So which one, what do you see? Okay, now I see managing aphids. Okay, so I'm going to back up. So for some reason, you're not seeing my picture. There we go. So I just, know. I'm sorry. Sorry, that, sorry, Steve, it's Jane. Yeah. And you, it looks like um, we're seeing your presenter mode. Okay, so. At, let up me, at the top, can you click display settings? Yeah. And then see if swapping the screens will where it says swap presenter view and slideshow. That looks good on my end now. Does that look okay looks, to you? Looks great. Is that better for you guys? Yep, yep, we're good now. Okay. So I should mention that I have a colleague of mine, Jane Stanley, who's our technical manager who just joined Bear back in the late fall. And I've asked her to join us today and you can see why. When you have a good technical manager, she shows you how to make technical presentations. That's a good thing. Thank you, Jane. We may hear back from her later. So let me just quickly go back through aphid. So I mentioned that you have uh, on the lower right hand picture, you see there, it's a nice, sharp, clear picture of uh, a female aphid that's giving live birth. And that's unique to aphids. They don't necessarily lay eggs. They actually give live birth. So like a lot like animals, like mammals, um, they, they, uh, they give live birth, birth to their offspring. In that, uh, another thing you might notice about both of those pictures on the right-hand side is that the aphid itself has these two spine-like um, protrusions coming out of their, near the, the, the rear abdomen, on their uh, upper abdomen. They look sort of like uh, little exhaust pipes is what I call them. They're called cornicles. That's a defining feature of aphids. So if you're looking at a bug and you're wondering, hmm, I wonder what that is, if you can see the, those little cornicles that are, looks like little spines that stick out uh, on the rear end, we call it the south end of a northbound aphid, uh, then you can, you can readily identify it as being an aphid. Hopefully that all makes sense to you. Now that upper right-hand picture has a great uh, a great view of of the um, uh, honeydew that is being excreted by by the uh, feeding aphid. So what that aphid has done is it's extracted some of the of uh, the juices either out of the um, uh, the xylem and phloem or out of the, a leaf cell. It's digested that and then it deposits it as a honeydew. It looks very clear, just like water, but it has sugars dissolved in it as part of its um, excreted material. And that'll drop down on the leaf. And, and, and for aphids that are feeding on the underside of the leaves, that'll drop down on the lower canopy of leaves. Again, that's another telltale sign that you have something that's feeding from up above and it's dropping down this uh, honeydew material. Uh, a lot of that is, um, really just nothing more than just a, a wet, shiny look to the leaf, except eventually there will be a saprophytic fungi, kind of a non-pathogenic fungi called sooty mold that'll begin to grow in that honeydew solution on the leaf. And it causes it to turn a blackish color, which could be a very aesthetically displeasing to a customer. And that's a main reason you want to get rid of aphids. Aphids will cause some damage to the plant, especially when you have a heavy infestation. But it's that honeydew and that sooty mold that begins to grow uh, in the honeydew that can cause a real problem uh, in terms of the looks of a crop. And that's important in ornamentals because that's what we're essentially selling is, a, is aesthetics of the plant. Now, keep this in mind. There are other types of insect pests that can also um, deposit honeydew. Uh, white flies will, scales and mealybugs will as well. And we'll be talking about a couple of those in a second, but I just want to uh, let you know, whenever you see that honeydew solution, you start to see a little sooty mold, you know you've got an insect infestation somewhere and you probably need to get on it uh, pretty quick, get it identified and, and determine which, of, uh, which product that you can use to control it. 
which leads me, which leads me, which leads me to my next slide. And now let's see if I can, there we go. I'm gonna have to use my, uh, the slide feature here to advance. And so I wanted just to talk about what are some of the solutions for managing APHIS? It just so happens, uh, and I'm gonna self, sound kind of self-serving when I'm talking about our products, but we have two really good products uh, in our portfolio, Altus and Contos, that do an excellent job of controlling aphids. And I'm gonna talk probably not just in, in this particular insect, but in the ones to come, about two approaches to controlling them. One is a preventative, so if you happen to know that you're going to have a problem or you want to prevent the problem because maybe um, you've got plants that are in hanging baskets or it's, uh, you've got a particular area that you want to treat those and you don't get back to see them that often for those of you that are on the, uh, uh, the landscape uh, management side and you want to prevent an aphids infestation, you're going to have to drench the soil solution and the surrounding roots so that you get the product taken up over time to protect. So we call that a systemic drench control or a preventative control. And both Altus and Contos are really effective products for controlling aphids. I'll also mention Mainspring, which is produced by a, a friendly competitor of ours, Syngenta, that works uh, equally well, just as good a product. Uh, but in terms of cost and use and value, I think Altus is a great choice for you to consider. Now, if you get to a circumstance where you have an active infestation, and I call that more of a rescue circumstance. You have to come in and rescue the crop from going down with a, a heavy infestation. We have to shift over to contact spray control. Um, and the reason is, is because when you use a contact spray or you spray, you get much faster results than you could through a systemic trench. When you drench the product, it takes a while for that material to get taken up and translocated up and through the plant and it'll be very important for, um, for you to use in a rescue circumstance, something that works a lot faster than that. Again, Contos, Altus, I've mentioned a few other uh, competitive products, but very effective products out there, Aria, Ventigra, Decathlon, all of those are great options for controlling aphids. They all represent different modes of action, so you could actually use those in a rotation. Not that you'd have to choose five of them, but you might choose two or three or four of them to put into a rotation so that you get good control. So I'm gonna move on from, uh, from aphids here. And uh, are we tracking okay here, Summer? You can see and um, we're, doing, uh, we're doing okay with seeing the slides as we move along. Okay, fantastic. So the next, so I've gone from the easiest one to what I think is gonna be the hardest one we're gonna discuss today, and that's thrips. Now, first of all, I'm gonna make sure all of you effectively say the right word. There's no such thing as a thrip. They're all referred to as thrips. So whether there's one thrips or a whole host of thrips, it's the same word. It's like fish. There's always, you can have one fish, you can have a school of fish, right? Well, thrips is sort of the same way. Thrips are very, very small insects and they're, they're difficult to see, especially um, at the nymphal stage when they've uh, just hatched. And you can see in that upper right-hand picture, that is a raging infestation of thrips. I mean, that's a lot, that, that's a population that you know, you'd almost have to really work hard to get that bad on a plant. But this is uh, kind of indicative of the, of the challenge we have with thrips. They're very small, therefore they can get down in these little nooks and crannies of the developing leaf axles and they create damage when that leaf is very, very young, just as it's emerging. And once you've, uh, once you've inflicted some damage to that leaf, as it grows out and expands, it's gonna be uh, distorted and it's gonna be contorted and it's gonna look uh, very, very unnatural as it emerges. Another challenge that we have with thrips is that they're vectors for a variety of uh, viruses. And so sometimes uh, it's just one thing just to have a thrips infestation and worry about the damage that can be caused just by the feeding habits of the insect itself. But the fact that it also vectors disease can be an altogether different scenario that can literally ruin a crop. There is no cure for viruses. As we're learning with COVID, there's no such thing as curing a virus. Once you get a virus, you've got a virus and you just have to write it out. In the, in the case of our crop, more growing plants ultimately sometimes have to throw the plant away. Now, 
another challenge we have with thrips is that we can control them with systemic insecticide uh, treatments. However, a number, if not all of the systemic insecticides do not move up into the flower parts. So the systemic treatments are very good for the vegetative, the leafy parts of a crop. However, when you get into the flowers and you can see the picture in the lower right-hand side, maybe you can see uh, right there near the center, there's actually a thrips that's feeding on some pollen right there. That's a, that's a, that's, that, that's a, that's a steak dinner for thrips is pollen. They love to feed on pollen that's in flowers. And so the problem in this circumstance is that we don't have any of the systemic insecticide that can get up into that flower part, specifically in the pollen, to control them. So we're sort of obligated to keep an eye on the infestations and the, and the level of how, how much of an infestation we have. And if you begin to see thrips that are uh, feeding in, in the flower, you're most likely gonna have to go to a rescue circumstance and make a spray to control them. Thrips as insects go through a wide range, a complete cycle of, of uh, entities going through its life cycle. So it starts as an egg, obviously, then goes to a number of nymphal stages, then it'll go through at least one, if not two uh, pupal stages before it emerges as an adult. The adults uh, have wings and the, so the adults can move around and fly. And this is what represents our biggest challenge in the landscape and in the nursery, as well as the greenhouse, is that after we go through the spring months, and we usually don't see a lot of thrips activity early in the spring, but as we move into the later spring and early summer, we start to see thrips numbers rise. And a lot of that is due to the fact that the thrips initially, the nat native populations are feeding on native plants. So they're feeding on wildflowers and trees and shrubs that are flowering. But as those plants go through their flowering cycle uh, and that ends in the spring, all of a sudden the thrips don't have anything to feed on. They go looking for food elsewhere and they'll come to your nursery and they'll come to your greenhouse to find food to eat. Another thing that we see with thrips is that when you have a, a mowing crew that'll go through and mow, say the, the, the roadsides that have wildflowers and they disrupt the food sources for thrips, they'll go looking for other areas to find foods and usually cultivated crops is uh, where they end up. Also, we find thrips uh, get released when there's harvesting that's done. So if you happen to be near farmland and you wonder why in the heck did I wake up this morning and everything's covered with thrips, and you look outside and you notice that they were harvesting a crop nearby, sometimes when those crops are harvested, it'll release thrips into the atmosphere and the, the adults will fly in. So thrips are, are very pervasive. Uh, they have a broad spectrum of different plant species and different hosts that they can uh, 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 find uh, food sources for and that they will infest and attack. And so they can be very challenging to control. And the fact that they're down in these nooks and crannies of the plant always makes it difficult, number one, to identify them and see them. And number two, uh, to get some chemistry that you can spray that'll actually get down to them and provide some control. Again, we use a similar strategy with thrips that we did for aphids. And you probably think I'm uh, uh, on repeat here. Uh, like a broken record, uh, both Contos and Altus are very effective products on thrips. Uh, again, they're, they're uh, a, a type of insect that uses uh, piercing sucking mouth parts uh, to extract uh, goodies out of the plant. And so again, we can utilize a strategy of preventive control where we can uh, treat the crop with a preventative systemic insecticide. In this instance, I'm suggesting Contos as an option though Altus and Mainspring uh, are also alternatives that could be utilized. We have some different choices though when it comes to spray applications. Um, Expire, which is a Corteva product, the uh, Hatchy Hatchy, which is a C-Pro product. And that's always the product that I've always said, how in the world did they come up with that name? But that's a talk for another day. Uh, I don't know what Hatchy Hatchy means, other than it is a very effective insecticide uh, for thrips. And finally, Altus. Uh, Altus has great activity on immature stages that you might find on the foliage. So again, we're, we're trying to, I'm trying to give you some ideas for different ways for um, addressing the problem. If you know you've got a crop, you know you're gonna have to prevent it from getting thrips infestation. Let's say you're a greenhouse planting some hanging baskets that are gonna be hung up uh, high in the rafters of the greenhouse. You may wanna use a systemic approach because you may not see 
the infestation till it's too late if you've got plants that are sort of out of view and use a systemic treatment. Uh, however, some of you will use some monitoring processes. Those of you that are landscapers going out uh, and going and walking around the landscapes uh, have ways of taking a look at those plant materials to see if everything is looking okay. In, if and when you see an infestation taking place, here's some suggested products that you can utilize for control. All right, let's move on from thrips and I'm gonna uh, kind of cheat just a little bit here. I'm gonna combine two different um, insect pests into one little uh, series of slides here because I'm gonna talk about managing mealybugs and scale insects. The reason that I combine these two is because a lot of the characteristics and, and quite frankly, um, from an entomology standpoint, they're very similar types of insect pests and they're actually in the same, uh, the, the same order and uh, very closely related um, uh, as insects. Scales and insects, can, uh, excuse me, scales and mealybugs can sort of be talked about uh, one and the same. Now, unfortunately here, Summer, I've got our, our lovely pictures here. So let me see if I can minimize that. Ah, there we go. Our pictures were covering up some of my slides here. So my talking points were hidden. One of the things that I think um, I've encountered over the years, and, and just to give you a little history in, in my background, I started my career actually working as a plant health manager for a large uh, container growing operation here in Texas, and then uh, worked in a larger uh, greenhouse operation as well early in my career before moving into uh, sales and, and technical support. But I can tell you that over the years, these are two of the most difficult to control pests. And, and a lot of the reasons are kind of obvious. They, they, they form these protective waxy coverings or these fibrous mats and the positioning of them in the, uh, in the axles of leaves or on the undersides of leaves make treatments a lot more difficult. Uh, like aphids, both of these produce honeydew excretions. And so you, you, you can and will see those uh, honeydew deposits on the lower leaf canopies if you have um, a moderate to heavy infestation of these. And so you need to be careful. And if you see sooty mold growing, you know you've got a problem. You've got to get in and get that treated as quickly as possible. I refer to mealybugs and scales sort of as the quiet assassins because they're sort of slow but sure. Um, you don't really notice them as much. Sometimes they kind of can sneak into there. Or you just might overlook them or you might just think, ah, they're not a big problem. And then all of a sudden one day you look up and you've really got a real problem, a real issue. So. You really need to be uh, cognizant of, of where to look, which crops to look for, and especially if you start to see uh, an infestation start to get on it right away. Initial infestations oftentimes are, are small, they're isolated, they can be difficult to detect, but I'm telling you after two or three life cycles, their populations can, can begin to build exponentially and it's almost like they came out of nowhere. Uh, I, I mentioned the, the fact that sooty mold can be an issue, so keep an eye out for that. And one of the things about mealybugs, and especially about scale insects, is that they have hundreds, if not thousands, of susceptible ornamental crop and plant hosts. And so it really makes it a challenge uh, to grow something where you're, I mean, my, if you're managing a nursery or if you're managing a landscape, you know you're going to have scale issues somewhere sometime. So keep an eye out for those. Again, as I mentioned earlier, mealybug masses and those individual scales have these waxy coverings on them. Uh, they act as a very good protectants for them. And so you've got to be um, uh, aware of how you're going to get to them to control them. And I'll talk about that here in just a second. Um, as I mentioned, uh, you know, the, the nooks and crannies, uh, the undersides of leaves, uh, along the stems, you really need to keep an eye out, especially on crops that you know are susceptible to scale and mealybug problems. I don't claim to be a mealybug expert. Um, I know them when I see them. Uh, they, you know, I, I couldn't begin to tell you all the different types of mealybugs. Here's some pictures of a few different ones, but they all have a, a few similar characteristics. 
Number one is those horizontal ridges that you see across the backs of their abdomen. That's a, that's a clear defining um, descriptor that, you, uh, th that if you see these, you'll know that you're probably in the presence of a mealybug. You'll also notice that they have uh, around the perimeter of them that they have these uh, little hair-like structures. Again, that's sort of a giveaway. They look like legs, but they're really not. They're just protrusions from uh, the perimeter of their abdomen. And then finally, a lot of times they'll begin to, to excrete um, a, a fibrous material that allows them uh, over time, uh, this is where they'll lay their egg masses. It also protects them uh, from predators and in particular uh, sprays that we might uh, be trying to control them with. Here's some examples of different scales. And, and uh, again, there are a lot more uh, prevalent, I think, in the in woody plants than, uh, than our mealybugs, but all of them are very, very challenging to control. And one of the things you see with scales is once they get on there, you, it's very difficult to get the scale itself off. Uh, you, can, you can actually control the feeding portion of that, uh, that, that, that little scale that's uh, up underneath there, the feeding the stage of the life cycle, and it could be dead, but that little waxy covering will remain. And so there's really no way to get it off. Over time, they'll fall off if there's not a live um, insect underneath. Uh, but you, know, you can see in that picture on the upper right hand, that happens to be crepe myrtle bark scale. And once you get a, a, a covering of that scale on there, it almost looks like it's part of the plant because uh, it's real hard to get off. One of the uh, telltale uh, signatures of scales that you can see in that right, uh, excuse me, that left-hand picture is that you start to see some nutritional issues and the, the leaf just doesn't look healthy. And now you see some of the leaves are emerging and they're not expanding properly. And you start to look closely along the veins there of those leaves and you can actually see the scale insects that have attached themselves and are feeding right there. Uh, the picture on the, uh, on the lower, lower right hand side is a, is a brown scale that's, I believe that's probably a sago palm, looks like, but, uh, a case in point that the activity is all on the underside of the leaf. I'm not so sure whether you guys are seeing crepe, mar uh, crepe myrtle bark scale there in Oklahoma or not. It, it, it sort of migrated over from the southeast. We've seen it here in the Houston area where I live, all up through East Texas. I wouldn't be surprised if you're seeing it up your way as well. This is a very challenging scale to control. Uh, we find in the nursery that if we drench with uh, some systemic insecticides, we can get very good control early on. And that's the key. We want to get this product cleaned up early. Uh, those of you that might be working out in the landscape, if you see this, again, you can use uh, sprays, contact sprays, and I'll give you some suggestions here in just a second of what to be looking for. Uh, here's some, just some more pictures of mealybug infestation. Since I showed you some nasty looking scales, I thought I'd show you some mealybugs as well. I actually took um, several of these pictures. And uh, of course, when I'm out looking at stuff at, at a commercial nursery and see this, it's a beautiful thing to me because uh, that's more money in my pocket because they're gonna have to spray something to get rid of that. But if you're a manager and you see that, that's not such a good thing. And, and uh, I think it's incumbent upon you to know, number one, which plant species am I growing either in the landscape or in the nursery that might have these kinds of infestations. And if so, if I am growing those, you've gotta be on top of a scouting program that allows you to get around and see these problems periodically. Okay, well, let me run through some control strategies as quickly as I can here. I, I hate to be redundant, but again, uh, a prevention versus a rescue strategy with, with scales and mealybugs, unfortunately, I think prevention is really the best thing to do. Uh, you obviously don't want to have to treat your whole landscape or your entire nursery, uh, so it helps to, to know if you have some plant species that might be uh, more susceptible to scale uh, pests so that you can sort of strategically treat those on a preventive basis. Uh, but just like we do with the, the, the other prevention and rescue strategies, uh, we have to use systemic long residual insecticide drenches for the prevention strategy. Um, we have uh, Altus and Contos are, are really effective there. I like to see the use of an insect growth regulator. Some of them are systemic, some need to be sprayed, but Instar and Distance are two that I like to see in the rotation during the crawler stage. And then for rescue strategies, 
um, you really got to find something that's got uh, residual control. You can't spray something that's just going to be there for a short period of time. Uh, otherwise, you'll be out spraying repeatedly to get good control, or you're going to have to spray a systemic product that uh, has a little bit better longevity. In, in, in the case of making a foliar spray, I highly recommend an effective adjuvant some kind of a penetrant, a penetrating surfactant that gives you not only good spread of the material over the leaf, but also might penetrate inside those waxy structures so that uh, the spray solution can carry in the, um, the toxicant, the insecticide that you're spraying to kill those, uh, those pests. The non-residual contact insecticides oftentimes aren't very effective just because they don't hang around long enough uh, to, to work well. So you'll need a type of a product, I know Seven's got good contact uh, residual. Some of the pyrethroids, uh, things like um, Talstar might be an opportunity, a good example to use. Uh, some people love to use uh, oils, the horticultural spray oils. You can actually put those along with the contact insecticides. I think they make a good one-two punch, but you gotta keep in mind that the horticultural spray oils and the dormant oils, don't have much of a residual. And so the first rain that comes along or the first irrigation that comes along, um, they'll likely be washed off and won't be around. Here's some, uh, some insecticides. And for those of you that want all this information, don't forget that I'll, uh, I'll have a copy of this presentation uh, available this summer uh, that she can send out that has all this info here for you. But preventative insecticides, Contos, Altus, you probably wondering why does he keep talking about Contos and Altus? Well, one of the things you'll notice, all of these insect pests I've talked about so far are piercing sucking insects. And Contos and Altus are highly systemic within the plant. And therefore they do a great job as systemic insecticides on sucking piercing type insects. And so you'll find all of these pests that I've discussed on our label Another advantage of using both Contos and Altus in a production nursery or production greenhouse environment is that they have a zero REI uh, when you apply them as a drench. So that's a, a real advantage. Whereas uh, Contos has a 24 hour REI as a spray. So we like to see Contos when we can go out as a drench. Again, uh, try to thoroughly saturate that ent entire soil media with the drench solution. If I didn't mention that earlier, those of you that are in a production nursery or even in a landscape setting, make sure that soil environment has plenty of the, uh, the, the solution, the drip solution applied so that the roots have, a, have an adequate chance to take up the material. Some rescue insecticides that you can use uh, for these types of pests, and I can't uh, speak strongly enough about how well Altus works uh, as a spray solution option, but Altus, Talus, Aria are all effective on mealybugs and scales. And so uh, if you have a situation where you need to make a foliar treatment, uh, they work really, really well. Contos works well uh, also. It just, like I said earlier, has a, a 24 hour REI. So if I were choosing a situation in a rescue circumstance, I think I would probably go with Altus. It has a four hour REI uh, under these types of circumstances as a spray. All right, let's, uh, let's head to the last group here. And as I mentioned, I'm, I'm taking a little license here because I'm treating mites along with an insects talk. And so I think you all probably realize that mites are a little different than insects. They're in the arachnid order. So they're different than, uh, than insects. Uh, they also uh, are commonly identified because they have four pairs of legs where insects have three pairs of legs. And so that's a defining feature. Most mites, in fact, all that I can think of uh, are wingless. Therefore, they're, they can crawl. They move around by a technique called ballooning where they actually spin a web uh, up into the air and get the, the, the wind currents will capture that web and drag the mite along with it. And it'll blow for a distance and drop it down somewhere. So mites can move, but it's uh, through a physical means uh, called ballooning with, uh, with uh, some of the... Um, uh, the webbing that they can that they can manufacture uh, to do so. They don't actually fly. There are four main economically important groups of mites that we deal with uh, when it comes to ornamentals. Uh, there are the spider mites or the two spotted mites, which you see there on the left. Uh, in the lower uh, center, you have what are 
are referred to as areophyid mites, and I'll talk to those a little bit more and the importance of them in our landscape. Uh, broad mites, which is in the center to the top. And by the way, I should mention that both broad mites and areophyid mites are very small, almost naked. I mean, uh, uh, invisible to the um, naked eye. And, uh, and, and so that makes them especially difficult to see and to identify. And then a fourth, and maybe not quite as important, but a fourth group known as privet mites uh, are also uh, can be important in ornamental. So uh, spider mites or two spotted mites, broad mites, areified mites, privet mites. These are four groups of mites that are all um, important. And I mentioned them because some of the miticides that we have available are only effective on certain types of mites. So you might have one that's only works on broad mites and uh, two spotted mites, or you might have one that's really effective on privet mites, but not so good on the others. So you really got to understand a little bit about what mite you're dealing with, number one. And then number two, um, you've got to make sure you match up uh, the right type of miticide that's effective on those types of mites. I'll get into that in a little more detail here in a minute. But as far as identifying uh, what kind of um, uh, symptomology you might be confronted with with mites, I've got a, a two good pictures on the left there that uh, really identify what we see with spider mite damage. In fact, that, that leaf there is probably a, a very extreme case. Hopefully you'd never let a crop get away that far, but that's what can happen with a serious uh, spider mite infestation. Those mites are likely on the bottom of the leaf. Uh, they are uh, puncturing the individual cell, cells and then pulling the material out of those cells and those cells die and turn white. And if you have enough uh, activity with the mites, you have so many of those dead cells, they start to look like they're coalescing and they sort of like look like a mottled leaf in terms of its color. But what that really is, is just dead cells and amongst a few green cells there. If your infestation gets really bad, you'll start to see some webbing with spider mites, which you see there in the upper left. And if you get to that circumstance, uh, you're probably at the point where you need to throw some plants away. Uh, if you're in the landscape, you probably need to get out the pruning shears and get to work. But uh, that webbing will protect the mites from predators, as well as it makes it very difficult when you're spraying for the mites to get the solution, the spray droplets down to where the mites actually are. So when you have the, that webbing form with spider mites, you're really into some, uh, some serious infection right there and you've got some, some issues. On the right, uh, upper right with that uh, rose that has what looks like some red growth emerging, that's really a result of rose rosette. That's a virus that is transmitted by areophyid mites. And as a result, that areophyid mite will infect that particular rose plant when it starts feeding on it with the virus that virus multiplies inside the plant and it uh, gives rise to a lot of um, a very strange looking growth. And then over time, uh, you'll end up with that sort of taking over that rose plant with that wacky looking uh, reddish rust colored growth. And you'll just have a vegetative, uh, uh, you know, spiny mess there that really doesn't look like a rose or function like a rose. And that plant would need to be thrown away. Again, like I said earlier, you can't control viruses. Once you have it, uh, the plant's a goner. The lower right-hand picture is a great example of broad mite damage, where the broad mites get way down inside that emerging leaf axle, and, it, and it'll actually start uh, feeding on those leaves as they're emerging uh, as, as, as unexpanded, tiny little leaves. And then as those leaves begin to emerge and, and they try to expand, they've been damaged by the broad mite, and you get contorted uh, growth that's, um, that's very unnatural. And also, uh, obviously, those leaves aren't going to photosynthesize like they should. And in this case, this is a pepper plant, so you're not going to have a very good pepper yield as a result uh, of that kind of uh, broad mite damage. Broad mites are pretty obvious with the, the, in, the injury to the plant that they cause, whereas spider mites and areophyid mites uh, tend to be, well, areophyid mites hard to see, but you can certainly see that crazy growth there. But spider mites, you can actually visually see the, the, um, the impact on the plant. And uh, you can oftentimes identify you know, the type of mite that you've got based on that kind of damage that you might see. 
So let me just uh, talk quickly about managing mites and then we'll talk a little bit about control. Mites are one of those pests that really require periodic inspection. You really got to have a scouting team or you've got to have employees that sort of know that when they don't see something that looks quite right, that they'll go to their supervisor and let them know, or you need a team that can go out and effectively scout for mite activity. One of the things that's, that's, uh, that's good about mites in terms of, uh, of a scouting is that as soon as the temperatures start to warm, mite populations begin to grow rapidly. So when we're in weather like we have right now or cooler uh, times of the early spring, mites may not be as big of an issue, but as we begin to warm up and we start hitting those uh, you know, high 70s, 80 degree days, low 90s, that's when you can expect to see mite populations begin to really grow. One of the things I've seen in the course of my career, and I've been doing this a long time, is miticides kind of come and go because the fact that their populations grow so fast, uh, they can develop resistance um, as a group, localized resistance to various miticides that have been repeatedly sprayed. So we really have to adhere to very strict mode of action rotation, which means you've got to find some different products that have different uh, modes of action, uh, mode of action groups and, and then uh, insert those into a program so that you're rotating different mode of action groups as you're doing a rotation of sprays. You also need to pay attention to what kind of mite do I have? You know, what, uh, what's the, the, the stage of the life cycle? Well, let me just speak to the life cycle first, the stage of the life cycle, because some miticides are only good on controlling the nymph and the feeding stage. Some are only good at controlling adult stages. Some are only good at controlling the egg stages. Uh, some do all or, or, or one or two of those stages. So you need to understand the miticide itself and you'll have to talk with the manufacturer of each or read their literature to understand that. Uh, the other thing is just what type of mite do I have? So some different mites have uh, different levels of susceptibility tolerance, if you will to different miticides. So you have to choose your miticide based on the life cycle your, your, uh, your miticide is best at controlling and also what type of mite it is you're trying to control. This is one instance where biological controls are very useful, especially for you greenhouse growers. And that's because uh, first of all, we can keep those, those, um, those beneficial insect predators in an enclosed environment. And by and large, they can do a the right, um, the right predators can do a pretty good job keeping mite populations in check. It's when our environmental conditions change and those populations of mites begin to ramp up faster than the biological uh, 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 controls can ramp up their particular populations that you get a runaway infestation. Uh, one of the things that you can utilize with timely scouting is to identify hot spots. This works especially well in greenhouses and nurseries, though it can wor work in uh, landscapes as well, because oftentimes you'll see the mites sort of starting in an area of a crop, and it may not necessarily have infested the entire crop. Remember, mites don't fly around, so they, they do keep kind of, you know, within an area of only where they can walk to or leaves that are touching, they can bridge over from one plant to another. And so the, the, the infestations tend to start out as more of a hot spot rather than just kind of a universal, even infestation across a broad area. Important for you to know that because if you've got workers out there that uh, if you happen to see a mite infesta infestation, I suggest you bring the workers that are working in the greenhouse over and say, hey, see this, this is what a mite infestation looks like. If you ever see this, make sure you tell your supervisor so we can get the plant health guys over here uh, to make um, a proper control to control that hot spot. So again, it takes some, some diligence, it takes a little bit of scouting, but it'll, it'll pay off in spades if you, uh, if you stay on top of it. Just a quick uh, picture here of, a, of, of how fast these spider mites can, uh, can develop and their populations can grow. My uh, life cycles, can be completed in as few as seven days at, at 85 degrees Fahrenheit. So that is amazing that you can complete from, from egg to a egg laying adult within seven days. And, and the challenge here is that females can live up to four weeks and they can lay up to 500 eggs each in a lifetime. So sit down sometime if you want and uh, test your math skills and see how fast these populations can explode 
literally exponentially over a matter of a week or two, go from dozens to, to millions and billions over, over a period of time. And if your conditions are right, the populations can grow very, very fast. That's why we really have to stay on top of, of mites. We're very fortunate uh, at Bayer. We've got one of the uh, foundational products in the marketplace. It's called Savat. Now, those of you in the landscape and turf markets, we sell it under the brand name Forbid. Uh, these are twin sisters that are the same exact product. We just uh, label them for different uses in different markets. So the turf and landscape market uh, gets Forbid and uh, the, the commercial greenhouse, commercial nursery market gets Savat. But again, uh, what I'm going to say here is same for both uh, both brands. Savat and, uh, and Forbid both contain spiromephacin as the active ingredient. It is a broad spectrum miticide that has excellent residual mite control. They control all major, uh, all four major mite groups, those that I described at the beginning here. Uh, they have excellent translaminar activity, which means if you if you spray the upper surface of the leaf and that's all you get wet, it actually migrates through the leaf and protects the bottom of the leaf where the mites are feeding. So a foliar treatment of this on the, on the upper surface of the foliage will also control the mites on the bottom. It's highly effective also in controlling all the, all the stages, the feeding stages, both the nymphal and adult stages, as well as it has ovicidal activity as well. So uh, this is a really, a, a really great foundational product to have in your mite control program. It has long lasting residual activity up to 28 days. It has a unique IRAC group. So it's a unique mode of action group. And you can rotate it with all these options I've list, listed down here at the bottom, fluoromite, tetrasan, and hexagon. So uh, Mites are a challenge, they're tough to control, but uh, I think there's a lot of good tools available today. And hopefully you've got some, uh, some strategies in mind here that can help you uh, to manage your mite problems. All right, we're gonna wrap up and end here before we get into the questions. We've got about 10 minutes here, just under 10 minutes left. Um, these are some of the larcenisms. This is the stuff you get for free that I give you. Uh, these are the pest management truisms that I've picked up over my 40 plus years of, uh, of doing this. First of all, and you've heard me say this over and over again today, but I just wanna bring it home with a kind of a bullet point here. You drench to prevent and you spray to cure. If you wanna prevent an infestation before it gets established, then use a drench strategy. If you happen to have an infestation that's already started, you need to spray because spraying is fast, drenching is slow, but both are effective, but just use them as you need to. Now this is a, requires a little explanation, but dead is dead. So what do I mean by dead is dead? You'll hear people talk about, well, my product's systemic, or my product is curative, or my product is translaminar, or my product is a, a long lasting contact. You know, you hear those are features of what the different modes of actions are for an insecticide. I don't care about that. I care, care about a product that kills the product. You know, I, I, I use this as a kind of a, 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 a morbid example. You know, you can shoot me, you can strangle me, you can drown me, you can stab me, but dead is dead. And it doesn't matter whether a product is systemic. It doesn't matter whether it's a contact. What it matters is, does it work? And does it kill the pest that it's targeted for? You want to be ruthless in your uh, pest management, you want something that will control the pest that's causing you headaches, and you want to select a product, whether it's systemic, and that might be the best option in some circumstances, or whether it's a contact, or whether it's translaminar. All of those things could be important, but it, the most important thing is, does it kill the pest at the time that I'm trying to kill it? So just keep that in mind, that uh, dead is dead, it doesn't matter how it gets dead. Finally, the last thing is, Neglect is your biggest cost. If you neglect to um, scout your, your crops and to scout your landscapes and look for problems, that's gonna cost you more than anything. Uh, it's getting out ahead of these problems and you do that from, you know, from getting away from the computer screen and getting out amongst your crops and making sure that you're walking around it and that your personnel are trained to look for problems. Um, that neglect thing can become much less of a problem and end up costing you a whole lot less.
All right, there's Summer, that wraps it up for me. Again, here's my contact info. Uh, feel free to, uh, to contact me and uh, give me a shout if you need to. You can call me, text me, email me, send a smoke signal, whatever it takes. Come knock on my front door. I'll uh, just do it during a reasonable time of day. And I'll take care of uh, the questions you have. If we've got some, do we have any questions that you can see? Let me take a look here. Does anybody have any questions for Steve before we wrap up? I see everybody saying that it's working now. Yes, so that was great. And I know that everybody, nobody likes to ask questions a lot of times in these deals. And if you, you know, happen to run across an issue and it doesn't, not just limited to, you know, insects and mites, but if you have a disease issue, uh, you uh, have, have a weed issue, issue. By, by all, all means, means, please reach out to me. Uh, I'm here as a resource. I don't always have the answers. Many times I don't, but I know people who do. And so I'm happy to, to use the resources I have to find answers for you. Uh, that's really what our goal is. And uh, we'll do our very best to try to uh, keep your plants looking happy. All right, thank you so much, Steve. Anybody with questions? I think can they, if they can unmute, they're welcome to unmute and ask me if, if you allow them. If you allow that, I don't know, Summer. I don't know, how, what, I don't know what Summer allows, you guys, so. There was, there was a, something new. Yes. Jeff, and Jeff Campbell, thank you. It's, I, I'll, your, uh, your check's in the mail. <laughs> I know Jeff Campbell. All right, well, um, Summer, don't want to belabor. I know everybody's got things to do. Uh, please stay warm. Looks like we're in for a couple of cold, uh, rotten days here, but uh, you guys take mm -hmm. care. You know, that cold weather's headed my way. We're supposed to look at maybe getting a little snow or ice ourselves, which that's just, that's just- That's horrific. crazy, that's crazy horrific. for Houston, yeah. Yeah, Stephanie, horrific. Stephanie also says, thank you, Steve. Well, I, uh, I appreciate that. It's always a pleasure to be with you guys and. Uh, you know, COVID's kind of kept us all locked in the cave, but uh, looks like uh, maybe we're going to be able to get out and about. So I hope to see some of you face to face soon. So you guys all take care. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody who joined us today for this wonderful webinar. If you were joining us for CEUs, I'll be in contact with you shortly just to get some more information for you to make sure you get that credit. And have a great day. Thanks so much. Bye-bye now. Bye.